All right, good evening and welcome to the Sunderland Select Board. Today is the 26th, actually, um, of October. I think we have our, we got the 19th on the minutes there, I think. <clears throat> so tonight we've got a, a gatherings update, a highway update. We've got a municipal mowing IFB, a couple of APR notices for two properties. We've got an appointment to the community pathways, and we're going to discuss a draft budget memo. And then our usual COVID-19 uh, state of emergency update. Um, we may touch on some benchmarks for uh, the wage adjustment. Any select board and town administrator updates. So that's our lineup for tonight. Um, so why don't we tackle the minutes first from the 19th. <clears throat> Motion. Um, I'll second. All those in favor of the minutes for October 19th. Aye. Aye. All right. We're on tap for a 15-minute meeting, Dave. Ah, uh, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Antiques <laughs> Roadshow, 8 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. No. As, as long as it's not a Patriots game, that's okay. <laughs> no, that, we could miss the Patriots game. No, uh, yeah. All right. Um, and next up is a gatherings update. <clears throat> oh. Oops. So what, uh, what do we have on tap for that one, Jeff? Yeah, so um, I think that Given the, the pandemic, there's uh, more awareness of activities that are going on and, and concern um, just seeing people gathered. And so I think that, uh, you know, I wanted to in, invite the chief in to talk a little bit about what he's been seeing and, and how that's been going um, with regard to, you know, how the semester has gone so far yep. um you know it's it's been about two months since since uh schools have been back in session and so um thought it would be a good time to check in and and uh you know we have a, a representative from north 116 flats i don't know if that's mia or somebody else but i can um, see it yeah thought it might be Good to hear from them what their experience you know they they just opened this year and obviously it's a crazy year to to, to start um yeah but hear, hear how how things are going for them too all right yeah that, that'll be good um <clears throat> and especially because uh, I, I saw the announcement about uh umass looking to up i think in the spring semester to 60 percent occupancy wasn't that i think that's what at least what they're looking at at the moment you know yeah. we'll see how it how it pans out but <clears throat> All right. Um, why don't we turn it over to you, Chief? How's that? We can start start there. Sure. Uh, so I was asked to try to put something together to explain the basic the amount of calls that we've had uh, for uh, noise complaints around town to include the uh, major apartment buildings that we have. Uh, I sent Jeff a crude little Excel spreadsheet, just to kind of break down what we have for a uh, number of calls. Um, initially, the number of calls seemed to be quite alarming, but that's because the officers are actually entering in the, uh, the mobile systems that we have in the cruisers when they're doing business checks. So that spikes the number up for, uh, for the amount of calls for each of the locations. Uh, but taking that number aside and just looking at the other types of calls that we have from either noise complaints to vandalism, um, trespassing issues, medicals, uh, breaking and entering calls, things of that nature. Um, we have the largest uh, apartment complex is Cliffside. So that's 64 calls since um, August 28th. And uh, in comparison to that, uh, the next the next one is 19 calls, and that's for North 116 Flats. And then Amherst Grove at 15 calls, and then Sugarloaf Estates at 10. And then Pioneer Valley and Lantern Courts are in single digits. So, but as far as noise complaints, um, North 116 Flat was at nine since they opened. Cliffside has been at seven uh, since August 28th. And then Amherst Grove uh, was at two, which is Squire Village. Um, now, out of the nine noise complaints, um, it wasn't nine people called. It was how dispatch enters it into the system. Yes. Uh, multiple people call, and that's what it looks like on a few of these. 
probably seven or eight of the nine, more than two or three people called for the noise complaint. But it so only, it's kind of like if you, Tom, and I called about the same complaint, essentially we're counting each of those. It's all counted as one, as long yeah. as it was there on the same time. So okay. if someone called at, say, 1030 at night, and then two other people called within a few minutes, and the officer still responding, then that's still counted as one. Um, how um how does that compare to the same time period? I, I know you have to separate out North 116 because they weren't there last year. But if you separate that out, how does that compare to the same time period last year? And then like maybe what percentage of those are maybe like COVID only related? Because I'm just trying to get an idea of, you know, it is it, were we looking at a spike because because I noticed it, overall there's been a bigger spike in things like domestics and things like that nationally just because more, you know, for, because of COVID and things like that, so. Yeah, so uh, the police department has had a drop in motor vehicle complaints and yep. citations, but the calls for domestics or noise complaints have increased. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers for that, um, but in relation to the noise complaints that we had for the last few months, they were all regarding noise, not uh, COVID okay. infections. Now, during some of the investigation, we may have determined that in some, some instances there were um, COVID-related violations, uh, but we don't have a call reason for COVID-related instances. Yeah, okay. Um, th those get broken up into either a welfare check or a suspicious activity um, or whatever the, the person that calls it in as is reporting. Okay. Sometimes assisting other agency because we're assisting the Board of Health. Uh, so you'd have to really go through each individual call and then try to cop them out I'm going to mess that word, uh, list them into what category they go into. Yeah. Okay. So it'll make it a little more challenging down historically, probably to extrapolate that. It is because we don't have a call reason for COVID. So, so chief. Yes. Have, have you worked with the, uh, the board of health yeah. on, on if like, who does, who does mm -hmm. a resident call if they have a concern about a group that may exceed the governor's recommended? I mean, do they call you or are they call on the Board of Health? So over the summer, before they dropped it, uh, the amount, we were getting calls directly to us or through our dispatch. Yep. Uh, sometimes some of the calls came into the Board of Health and then they notified us. But historically, they called us directly. Uh, as far as getting calls for um, the last month or two, that hasn't been, not too many have been coming in through the Board of Health. So if during one of our calls, we figure out that there is a COVID restriction possible violation, I would then notify the Board of Health and also um, the manager of whatever apartment building, if it involved an apartment building. Sometimes we would get calls for people just hanging out, say in front of the laundromat. Uh, and that's not related to them to deal with that's related to the board of health and the police department to deal with. <laughs> okay so so if it, it is a covid you you a concern of the gathering you they would you would you would want to be called in right the the police because yes. you're 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 eventually going to get the call to come anyways Exactly. And it's easier if we were able to deal with it because a lot of times the COVID violations are, are more educational for on the part of the caller as well as the parties involved. Uh, a lot of people initially were calling because they saw groupings of five or 10 people outside and they thought that was a violation. And it's, it really isn't. I mean, the governor's order, if you have six foot or they're maintaining their social distancing or they have masks on and they're outside, it's not a restriction violation. So, so, so the big the noise complaints appear to be greater than in in past years. How how have you been dealing with that? It's been interesting. Uh, so the officers, you know, obviously still respond. Um, they try to document as many individuals as they can. Uh, when dealing with the noise complaint, we usually identify the leases of a dwelling, whether it be a duplex or an apartment, uh, then that way we can put into our system that the leases were either warned or fined. And when we're able to, I then extrapolate that data and give it to the uh, managers of each uh, apartment building. 
or if it's say a duplex or a smaller apartment building, we'll try to find, I try to find who the actual owner is instead of a business to try okay. to make the owner that, you know, these issues have come in. So, so what do you do with someone like when something like at North 116 flats, what do you do then? Cause, cause I, I, I know that's, that's been a concern uh, at least uh, the weekend before last. Sure. So the the uh, the management and the police department have been working uh, together since they since before they opened, and then since they opened, if we have any concerns of uh, the calls that happened over the weekend, whether they be noise complaints or they be other issues going on, uh, whatever I'm allowed to legally give them, uh, say from the dispatch log, I'll forward that over to the management so they have it, uh, whether it be Cliffside or 116 Flats or anybody else and inform them that this is, you know, the information that we received and this is how the officers handle it. And then management then goes about it on their way, however they deal with it. I know in particular with 116 Flats, um, my communication with uh, the manager there has been very positive and any information I can give her, she then also refers back to um, maybe not explaining exactly what they're doing because I know they have restrictions, but they would then notify the, um, the leasee that they're either going outside of their lease agreement or they're violating terms of whatever rental agreements they have and they would follow up on their end. Um, on top of that, if they're students of UMass, there's another uh, form of contact that we have with UMass uh, to notify them of what's going on because UMass has a strict no tolerance um, type of policy regards to either on campus or off campus. So you're saying that if it is a UMass student, the UMass student, it, it's not in his or her best interest to be getting a citation from any police department. Correct. Whether it be a citation or even a verbal warning. Uh, if they're informed that the uh, noise complaint came in, the officer would generate some type of report, whether it's part of the computer uh, aided dispatch or they put it in actual records uh, file. And of those portions of that are given to either UMass or the manager. Um, and uh, if they're given to the, uh, the manager, they handle it on their end. We handle it within our database. So we have a running tally of if somebody's dealt with a repeated amount of times. Um, and if they're a UMass student, we also notify them so they can take action on their end. So there's a lot of work on Mondays usually. Yeah. So for you, mass students, you've sort of got three levels really there. And, yeah. that's and I'm still working on the other colleges to get contact information for those colleges. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, Scott, Scott loves, Scott's lived next to a, uh, a complex for a number of years and I, I, I remember playing in the sand piles before they built the apartment complex behind my mom and dad's um, house also. So, but I, I don't, I don't ever recall um, maybe once or twice, maybe, maybe it was once or twice um, noise so loud that you could hear it inside their house. Um, but I, I've been told and I've witnessed that that's actually been happening at North 116. And, and I, I witnessed that personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very, I was very, dis, I was very, uh, I had received a call because believe it or not, the dispatcher um, that was reported to said, you should call your selectman. <laughs> and I go, well, usually they don't want selectmen enforcing anything because <laughs> We don't have a. We gave up our badges 20 years ago, right. um, so you don't. We don't want to. We don't want to enforce. You don't want us enforcing anything because we we have no idea. Um, but it it was um, it was noisy, and I also know that a telephone call was made because we had been told Scott David mm -hmm. maybe you remember that they were supposed to be 24/7 on-site management. Yep. Do you remember that, Scott, David? Correct. I believe so, yep. So I guess I, North 116 Flats is there. 
can you answer that question? Is there 24 seven Monday through Sunday, seven days a week management that can mm -hmm. be contacted? Yes, there is management that can be contacted. We have a seven day a week uh, schedule currently, not 24 hours. Our Monday through Friday schedule is from nine to six on site. Our Saturday is 10 to five and our Sunday is 12 to five. And you are speaking with Mia. This is Mia that is on, and I'm sorry that it's, it's blanked out on here. Um, <clears throat> in, in your name, please. This is Mia Weibel. I am the general manager over at North 116 Flats. And I have been in contact with Chief Eric um, on many occasions since before move-in actually we have met so that we could um, cooperate and do whatever was needed to keep the property quiet and safe and, and in COVID compliance as well. Um, yes, it's nice meeting you. Um... My name's Tom, and it's a. Uh, it's. Uh, I will say this, Tom. I'm. Um. I'm not sure what day you're referring to. That. That. And. And I'm disappointed that a dispatcher would call and say, "Call the selectmen when we've <laughs> always been very, very willing to work with. Chief Eric and, and his team, they came down, met us, we gave them a tour. We've, uh, like I said, um, made sure that they are able to get into our buildings, um, know our plans. We haven't had any um, outings, so to speak, due to COVID restrictions. But when we do, we intend to have the police on site as those at those as well to introduce them. Um, so I would have thought maybe somebody would have called us and management and have somebody from our staff come down and witness the noise there as well. And I don't think that happened. I did get a phone call that there was noise complaints on a Saturday. I don't believe it was this Saturday. It was the past Saturday. And I was one of the people who clearly called the Sunderland Police Department to let them know about it. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon, if I recall, um, when I got the call and made sure I called them directly, told them I didn't think it was an immediate emergency, but needed them to go over there to make sure that it was in COVID compliance, as well as it wasn't something that was gonna get out of hand in the evening. Um, so that was really the first time I started getting anything from the Sunderland Police Department as far as complaints and in writing was that particular incident. Um, and we did address those residents as well. Yeah, and that, that's interesting because my, um, and, and the chief and I have talked about this. Um, and and my, my feeling is that we are making our police do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, I, I'm a big proponent for, for neighbors talking to neighbors and, um, and, and trying to work things out amongst themselves first. It usually works out pretty well. Um, that's our board has actually been take, has take that step for a long time as well. Um, when, when I was, when I was notified of the concern, my first thing was, have you called the complexes management? And the answer is yes. Um, and it was my, my wife who called. So I don't question the validity in, in her making a call. And she was basically told that we know about it. We're doing something about it. We called the police. And then the uh, phone was hung up on her. Um, so that that was that was the contact with the uh, and she t and I I don't I was it a, I, it could have been a Shelley or a Riley or something like that was the person that she had talked to I don't remember specifically the name right now but I agree with you I I, I think the first the first uh, the the first thing should be allowed is the north the, the management of of the facility should be the first response. I think they have a responsibility. Um, I agree with you 100%. And I, I would continue, I would continue to say the same thing is that, that 
aren't the first call should be called to the management and see if they can address it. And then if it can't be addressed, then call to the police. Absolutely. I'll agree with that. Let me also say, Tom, that was the first thing I did on that previous Saturday when I was told that there were multiple people making noise in the courtyard that um, indicated to me that was over the limit of people that should be out there due to the COVID restrictions. And I did have my staff go out there first. Um, it was a um, one of our part-time CAs, I will say that, but they did not comply with RCA's, um, what they were asking them to do and to disperse. So that is when I called to the police station, to the non-emergency yep. line, letting them know what was going on over there. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting. I, the good thing is, is that they were playing uh, Agnes Young, ACDC. Um, I like Agnes Young, so hearing kids play Agnes, um, maybe not feel quite as old as I am. Um, so that made me that made me feel pretty good. And I like listening to Agnes, but not when I'm sitting inside a neighbor's house, because <laughs> uh, I could actually hear the hear the music inside the house. And um, I, I think I, I think that 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 level of volume was ex it was excessive. And I would tell the chief and I, and I have told the chief, I think the, the Sunderland police that responded was Brenda Tozlowski. Um, she, uh, in my opinion, did an outstanding job of working with the resident that had the concern, um, explained everything to that the resident, um, what was happening, what could happen, and to, to, and to continue calling. But sh um, she did so in a, a professional manner uh, 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 not only a professional manner, but uh, a manner, a mannerism with concern in her voice. So chief, uh, just like you restate, I thought Brenda did an outstanding job as far as that was concerned. But I did, just so you know, again, on, on what happened is that as soon as um, Brenda and the officer from Leverett drove through, um, there's a girl's voice could be heard <laughs> ringing through the courtyard, just settle down everybody. We'll be able to a party in a minute. Just let, let, the, let them go, then we can party again. So um, there was definitely a, um, a group that was not necessarily ready to um, abide by the um, agreements that they had with you on that particular day, that's for sure. But you could hear him, you could hear him screaming through um, in those words, and I thought that was again kind of amazing to hear. And according to our chat comments, it's it's happened a number of times apparently. So, yeah, hopefully that'll uh, that'll get nipped in the bud going forwards. I, I do want you to know we take it seriously. Um, when I have gotten these reports and have documentation on anyone, I do send them out a lease violation letter as well. Um, we do have a schedule of fines that they get. They're very, very minimum compared to what, um, you know, the town of Sunderland is going to charge them. However, there are still, you know, we still do take it seriously and are doing things to um, try to keep them from causing these issues and, and being loud and like no. you say, obnoxious and out well, of control just, where they shouldn't be or, or not abiding to the COVID laws. That's, you know, I'm, I'm taking a lot of hit on that as well due to the fact I can't open up the amenities that we offered because of the COVID restrictions. I mean, I, I just think that we all, we all just want to be good neighbors, you know? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, and on the one, <laughs> One, one person, one person um, basically said it sounded like a, uh, a dorm room. And I said, well, actually not at UMass. You, <laughs> it, I, I don't think that you would hear it. You wouldn't hear the music that loud being played, but um, it, it, it was loud and it, 
it, it was it was disturbing and 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 i i believe that you probably recognize that also <clears throat> thank you Mia. so mr chair if i could yeah please an area that i struggle with is you know getting a call from a concerned resident on a sunday morning um expressing um concerns about an, an abutting neighbor in this case 116 and recalling all of the uh, glad handing and sweet talking that the developers sent to us about how they were going to just be all sweetness and light with a delightful experience everybody around them and we are within six months and we have the first round of complaints so i struggle with the reputation that can be created with such an early set, and I say reputation in the marketplace for future renters, because these people aren't gonna live there necessarily for 30 years, and if they do we actually hope so, that's what was pitched to us as a town by developers, that we would be good neighbors, that we would be a stable community, that we wouldn't have the police on the site all the time. And what I'm hearing is phone calls on a Sunday morning, and I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in the management team and I'm disappointed in the state for allowing this project to even go to the point it is. Uh, we'll talk about the letter to the DHCD and our representatives after this, but I struggle with brand new facility and within six months of occupancy calls for noise. So that's my bit. I appreciate the fact that the chief and staff respond and both professional and, and you know, a, a soft touch kind of way. And they, you have to know your community. And I think our department does a very good job of that. I'm also a little sad and make myself a little sad to hear that we don't really have management outside of uh, business hours. We have management contacts, but then the rest of the opportunity is, is pushed off onto the town. I mean, that's too strong a term, but that seems to be the way it is. That said, I'd appreciate if that management structure could be reviewed. So a concerned citizen or a resident in the complex would have some measure of recourse with a direct connection. I have been in the management for some time and that direct connection is really, really important. So I'll leave it at that. And again, we'll talk about the letter to the state, DHCD, mass housing, and our representatives out of how disappointing this very early experience is for a very high profile case. Maybe we should just call the newspaper too. So, so David, yeah. um, before we go move, I would just like to confirm with, with Mia and the chief, <clears throat> if residents, if residents have, have a concern, noise concern, where should their first call be? to the police or to the management of North? What, what, what's recommended? So obviously any emergency should always go to our dispatch center. Uh, emergencies in 911. If it's a non-emergency number, they should call our dispatch center. Yep. So a noise complaint would, unless they hear, you know, somebody screaming for help, uh, but a noise complaint with a loud music, that would be uh, something for the police department to respond to and to enforce. We ask, and every time we've tried to speak with both parties involved. We also try to ask that the complainant also calls the management of oh, the complex. So if it's a complex to call their management and let them know. Uh, if it's a neighbor that has six apartments in a small house, they should notify the owner of that house as well. But okay. the police department would be the ones initially to handle the noise complaint uh, because yeah. the police can respond then usually the noise doesn't get shut down. In some instances, especially during business hours, management of any of the facilities is available and they have gone to quiet somebody down in the past. Okay, yeah, that's and, good and, to, to know. And, we and do one, have one, 20, we do, Tom, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We no. do have 24 hour emergency service. So anytime a resident calls, if there's an emergency, they're getting somebody who's gonna contact us contact management immediately if it's an emergency. Okay, so so I, I, I would say, you know, we, we know how to get hold of police real easy. How, mm -hmm. how would we get, how do we get hold of 
of of North, uh, North 116 flats. Yeah. You can call the main number, the 413-230-3874 number, and there's going to be somebody is going to contact us in case of an emergency. Um, if it's something that the town wanted our cell numbers on, um, I, I have no problem giving that. Um, the chief of police does have our personal cell phone numbers so that he can reach us after hours if there's an emergency as well. So if I could, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate yeah. the, the answer, Mia, I've heard I've heard the term emergency four times. So it's an, it, you have a concerned citizen that's inside of your complex and outside of your complex, but it's not an emergency. There's a, a gathering of X and there's a volume of Y when they're outdoors or on balconies or rooftops. Does that constitute an emergency or does that constitute a different level of response? Yeah, if they're if if they're out on some balconies or rooftops, and I'm going to consider that an emergency, <laughs> they should be out there. Um, if they're just out there and we address it, um, I, I think I, I did exactly what should have been done. We addressed it. They did not abide to our rules or want to listen to us. We're not going to, there's not anybody on my staff nor myself that's going to get into a fight or argument with a bunch of oh, college no. kids no, or, no, or no. family matters for <laughs> no. that matter. And I think calling at that point, I didn't consider that to be an emergency, yet it was something that the police needed to be notified. So I called the non-emergency number for that. I think in that situation, it was the right thing to do. Oh yeah, nobody wants anybody hurt or in a difficult situation, on the contrary. Uh, no, because five, five minutes one, five minutes in one direction is not gonna make a, that, that much of a difference. Yep. And, and also I, I think Brenda, by the time she came, she had uh, had a conversation with with the uh, officer that responded with her. So yep. I thought it was the, the response time was fine. I did have a conversation. If you're talking about myself, I did have a conversation with the officer that responded with with Brenda that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My property abuts North 116 Flats. And I'm wondering if you've done any outreach to the community or the residents to notify them of this information. I haven't seen anything um, to tell them that we should be calling management and who we should be reaching out to. Um, there are a lot of the, there are a lot of neighbors that are, who are not on this call that I think it's very important that they receive this information and that there is outreach for from North 160 flats to this community that has been um, changed forever because of this apartment complex. I will address that with uh, my manager in the corporate office. Um, but again, any neighbor can call our office um, at any time and they would get the emergency line as well. So I just wanted to add, I actually live like across the street from the neighbors who abut the North 116 flats. And to be honest, I didn't even know it was called North 116 flats. I was listening to the banging and crashing and beep, 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 beep for like a year. And then there was this day that it stopped and I thought, oh my gosh, finally. And then like the next weekend there were kids partying loud and you can hear it like just said I can hear it in my house across the street from Jess's house which is abutting the property and I my concern is that there's not enough being done to enforce the rules why is it that the kids are still doing this why is it that there's not an eviction problem you know thing like why I, I mean, if there are nine calls and it's always the same people, there's a problem with the management or the way those people are being dealt with. It's not, it's not sufficient, not severe enough. Let, let me, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I do not have one call on any of my residents that are multiple. I have not received anything 
from anybody showing that there was a multiple incident anywhere. We have addressed those immediately. I've got the unit numbers that we've addressed and I've got one report on them and only one report. So I'm not sure where that's coming from or why, but when we know there's an offender, we do address them. And usually once they are addressed by ourselves, or it being Sunderland Police Department, I haven't seen them on our radar again. Well, that's good news. Um, and I just wanna like reiterate what Jess said that there are a lot of people who feel like they are powerless to do anything. And I would really like North 116 Flats to send um, a, a letter to all the residents that are anywhere near your property and let them know who to call when there's a problem. Like I, I said, think, I, uh, I would think that wouldn't be that bad because you've only I, got one whole side of the property is non-residential. So you only have to deal with on the plum tree side and the other part of it. And, and I'm wondering, Jeff, um, I think that would be, uh, Julie, that'd be a good, um, a good way to outreach to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, Jeff, I'm wondering if, if it would make sense to maybe put a little somewhere on the site, a listing of the apartment complexes and any management contacts. So if nothing else, you know, maybe on our, our webpage. So do we have just like one little page that's got, you know, maybe above a certain size or something, you know, <clears throat> and then have the, the name of the complex and then any contact information there too, that might help as well. So that rem reminds me like, um, I had never heard of any like that, that neighbors should have the management um, numbers because the people right next door to me last year, it's been a rental for probably for 10 years now. And um, last year there were some young men there that were just out of control. And I didn't know there was no, I mean, I know there's a management company, but nobody ever gave me any like, where do I find that? I wish I could have called them. I wanted to call them. Yeah, if it's, it's probably a lot harder if it's a single house, I would suspect, you know, without to figure out that it's maybe owned by a management other than checking the records. So I, I basically, if, when, when yeah. we have noise complaints, say for the complex, we yep. obviously will try to notify the complex of uh, the, the, the violations. But we've had complexes, I'm sorry, we've had houses that were renting out four or five bedrooms, or we had large houses that turned into apartment buildings. Yeah. And um, when you look on this town of Sunderland GIS mapping, you can see who the owner is for each uh, property. Uh, so in some respects, some of the private, biz private houses that are turned into rentals, you can see who they're owned by. The problem with that is you may get say, you know, one, two, three Main Street Incorporated. Then you'd have to go on the Secretary of State's website, which I've done, to find out who the CEO, who the financial person is, to make contact with them and go about it that way. But if it's a noise ordinance or a disturbing the peace, that would be a police department call. And we would assist in stopping that noise, warning or finding the individuals present. Usually the people who are the, the renters or the leasees of those uh, complexes or of those uh, buildings, and uh, if it's a complex, we then notify the management. If we have a repeat offender, which we haven't had at 116 yet, um, they've, been, they've been identified and none of them have, been, have had a second round um, yet. But the uh, other buildings that we've had, say down on Old Amherst Road, we had um, a privately owned building that was a constant noise complaint a couple of years ago. And I reached out to the owner of that complex and explained to him that we had received numerous complaints coming from that house. And he went and spoke with his tenants and explained that the police had responded, that he had been told about that. And if it continued, it would be a lease violation. And they either subsequently moved or they stopped because we haven't had complaints at those houses yet. Okay, and I know this is a little off topic, but I was curious, there are often 10 cars there. The, the girls like have been responsive to um, any calls and whatnot. So I'm, I'm not, but like, that's a lot of cars that, you know, ends up like on 
I worry about cars coming down the road. It makes it so that they can't see past the cars that are parked parallel to the road. And I was just curious, I know in Amherst, they have laws about how many people who don't aren't related together can live in that kind of space. And I was just curious if Sunderland has any thoughts about those kinds of regulations. So Sunderland does have a regulation similar to that. The, um, if it's a private residence, like I think maybe the one you're talking about or others that we've had in town, that is a communication between zone enforcement and, and or the police, but usually the police don't deal with the enforcement of the amount of people living in a home, that would be zone enforcement. And then they would discuss with the landlord because each building is different. You know, you look at a house on the street, it may just look like a four bedroom house. Oh, but I've been in there. <laughs> but in some cases you go into these houses and it's, it truly is a house. That's when I, I believe that they would fall under the restriction of how many non-household members can live in the domicile. And going from there, that would be a, a violation for zone enforcement to then inform the landlord that they're allowing them because okay, so the renters don't know. I think not, maybe. I'm not sure I want to do this at the moment, but who would I call if- Oh, I, I was I was just gonna say, I think maybe funnel that through Jeff, I think it probably, right? Because then we could at least get it from there to the zoning board. Okay, Thank Julie, you. If, if, you let, if you let the town administrator know, the town administrator will talk to our, the zoning enforcement officer. The zoning enforcement officer for the town of Sunderland is our building inspector. Oh. So he would go, he would go to the, Jeff would contact a building inspector and, and the building inspector would do what building inspectors do when they act as zoning enforcement. And then if there was a, then if there was a concern, then the, someone could, if, if, and if it wasn't satisfied to your satisfaction or someone else's, the owner's satisfaction, then they would appeal that zoning enforcement officer's decision to the zoning board of appeals. But typically it, it, it does the zoning enforcement officer, the building inspector, he would take care of it. So Jeff could make a, a one telephone call and would be all set. Okay, thank you for that information. You're welcome. All right. So, oh. so Mia, what the, um, it, it appears um, they used to have they used to have welcome wagons in uh, the communities to get you to know the neighbors. Maybe uh, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea if you could just walk uh, Plum Tree from 116 down to uh, South Plain Road and hand out of some and get to know the neighbors. Some absolutely, absolutely. I did uh, get to know a couple at uh, move in, but. We will definitely um, look out to those residents, make sure they know who we are and who they can contact um, in reference to these issues. But I do think that we are doing the best that uh, we can to keep it down. Yeah, okay. Uh, and hopefully it's just a blip and we won't have any repeats. <clears throat> well, the, the police have other things to take care of. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and you know, it, it, it is a it, it is a quality of life issue and and chief chief knows sometimes th that that's what separates you know good communities from not so good communities is a quality of life and 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 quality of life is everything from walkability to to the speed that people drive to you know are, it could be noise and noise complaints. So as long as, you know, not saying you can't have fun, but everything everything can be done in moderation. Absolutely. Yeah, and we also include uh, road quality in that. And that's a good segue to uh, our next topic there, unless we have anything else on, uh, on that one. Uh, we're gonna talk about the letter addressed to DHCD, Mass Housing and our legislators. Yeah, sure. So we've got a draft in front of us and I appreciate the time the management of North 116 Flats has put out, but I'm of the mindset that we should also remind the powers that be on the deciding side of the 40B mechanism about the impacts that those decisions have. 
whether they're good and or bad. I think it's right. important to have that feedback sent to them so that we just don't move on uh, from uh, another decade's worth of either arguing or embracing a particular project. Yeah, no, that makes I sense. The, I think the correspondence calls out well, it doesn't make any uh, victims or persecutors or rescuers. It calls out well the history of how this project got to where it is in the very early life that we're having with this project and its impact on the town. So I make a motion to include that correspondence uh, to the DHCD, Mass Housing, and uh, our two legislators, Senator Comerford, as well as Representative Blay. Yeah, one wonders how many postmortems they do on their projects. You know? Yeah, I mean, but I worked in industry. It was always you checked in at certain increments of time, and the project had life, and they were, you know, you reviewed yep. for improvement. It was always review for improvement, and if it was a review for you know positive feedback, which some of this correspondence is, great. You still should know it. Yep, I would agree. You know, M Mia wasn't here. Well, my, I don't know. Maybe she was. Um, but when this first started 12, 14, 15 years ago, but, but I, I don't think we have, we have yet really seen a full plan of, of, of what's there. And Mia, that, that's, and, and that, that was, that was just a problem with the project from day one. Yeah. We, we, we were never, we never, we were, we always tried to just get a plan so we could discuss the plan. Like, and probably one of the things that we said, would have said is, well, let's make sure there's a fence up. And, and, and that's a pretty standard thing is to put up a fence between a, a complex and, 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 and the residential area. Because we had, when we put in sin hours, we were very specific on what yep. sin hours could do with their lighting because they were backed up against a residential area. Mm -hmm. And, and, but it, it was the zoning board really never had um, an opportunity to review any of the plan because it was never, it's always changed, you know, from the density of people to the configuration, to the height, we, it, it was, it was, and, oh. and no one, no one would ever say stop and let's, let's start over and try to make this happen. And, and let's try and let's try to let's try to make this you know try to make this work right right sort of a moving target in that respect absolutely um did you want a, a second on your uh, motion scott i second all right all those in favor of the letter to the dhcd aye aye, aye. all right <clears throat> thank you and hopefully, hopefully we won't have this topic on our agenda again. That would be nice to not have to see it up there. <clears throat> Let's hope not. All right. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Halloween's coming up, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for reminding me, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I was just thinking about it, so I'm sorry. I've no. been thinking about it for weeks now. Well, so. uh, back uh, 15 years ago, when uh, we had the October storm. We got in a lot of we got in a lot of trouble for canceling Halloween. It says no, we didn't cancel Halloween. Right. right. Um, so now now yeah. here we are. It's almost what is it? Fifteen years or ten years, Scott? Uh, it's, it's between those two because it was David's. I think first year was David. Yeah, two thousand ten was it? Yeah. Twenty ten, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ten, ten years. years ago. David's yep. first year, yeah. and he can't. David canceled Halloween. Canceled Halloween. That's right. Ten years later, he's doing <laughs> it again. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll get to that topic a little later. Yes, we will. <laughs> All okay. right. Thank All right. You. Thanks. All right. So I so see we got George for our occasional highway department update. How are you, George? Good, Neil. All right. Morning, What's going George. on? Right. Afternoon, George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's 2020, Tom. It's all a blur. Yeah. Yeah, you ain't kidding. A really slow-moving blur. So yeah. apparently the highway department's in another time zone now. So what's going on down there? Oh, uh, we're just getting getting ready, things ready for the winter time right now. Uh, got a couple small projects hopefully getting buttoned up by mid-November. Uh, we're supposed to be doing some more paving. Pine Court's going to get some new drainage. Basins rebuilt. 
uh, structures and old Amherst road is going to get a shim patch in certain areas for now okay. until we can figure out what's going on with that, uh, sewer manhole that's sinking. Um, uh, we had, we had some camera and done this, this fall or early, well, late summer, I guess you want to call it. Um, and we couldn't quite find anything. There was a couple variances in the, the pipe. So we're not sure if the whole manhole is settling or, or what's going on. So I'm going to you put a rock on George? that. What's you that? Got rocks in there? You got rocks? There was hardly anything in it. They had it. Gravel, they had it. No gravel? Very little. They had it vacked out and everything. And, and we didn't get, we got some sediment, but not very, very much. Um, huh. So we're not quite sure what's going on around it. So I don't you know say, if there's a bunch of gr groundwater. Say, yeah. The structure you're talking about settling, George, right? Yeah, it's not, that's not what in, we're wondering, yeah. yeah so. Not infiltration. No. So that's what we're wondering. So I think this year we're going to put a little riser on there and shim the road around it and kind of watch it to see if it does settle some more, and that'll be a good indicator that it is the basin that's settling. Mm -hmm. With the uh, drop in the groundwater level, maybe because of the dry, the dry year we've had? It started last winter, so it started hmm. in the winter time. Started to started settling. I could I could feel it once in a while with the plow, mm -hmm. yep. and, it, and it really started settling. So um, we're just going to keep an eye on it, try to figure it out because it's going to be a a pretty big project if if we need to dig that thing up because they're they're going to have to reroute all the sewer and have a little pump station and all that good stuff in there. So mm -hmm. it's not going to yeah. be an easy project. Okay. Hey, hey, George, could, how, how many um, culverts did you work on this summer? Culverts, uh, we replaced one at Park Road. We did, I think, five rebuilds on a couple, on some basins. Um, we still have a few more. We found, well, the camera guy was in town. We had him come up at uh, two of our basin or two two problem areas. One was on uh, Route 47 North. Um, we found that a telephone pole was drilled partially through one of our pipes. So we had a big sinkhole right next to it. Yep. So I'm trying to figure out with the uh, power company what we're gonna do with that one still. Then there's one up on Middle Mountain that we were having a sinkhole in, in uh, the first house on the right's driveway. And so we put a camera up that and found out that the pipes totally rotted on the bottom. So we're going to have to replace that whole run from from the basin on the top side of Garage Road to the single one that's up past past the first house there. Yeah. So there's basically two basins on that road, and we're going to have to replace all that pipe between the two. Uh, that's going to be next summer's project. Hmm. I, yeah, because it looked like you guys are doing you were doing some you did a, you did culverts this past year. That was good. Yeah. Okay. We try to get a couple, two, three, four, five of them in each summer. Uh, you know, time, time and material, what we can afford. So, yeah. How many okay. do we have in town overall? Do you know, like at the time? I've of actually never counted them. I, it's well over, <laughs> well over hundreds. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> three, four hundred. I don't know, maybe even more than that. Problem is, there's a lot of a lot of the basins that are in town and some of the flat areas. They're just sump basins. So they fill up with water and then everyone calls and say, hey, the water's not draining. They're plugged up. Well, they're actually not plugged up. They're just a big hole on the ground. So, right. yeah, yeah, those 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 uh, sumps, they the, they don't work that well, do they? Uh, they don't, especially the ones that are right in the middle of the road. The ones that are off the road don't don't flood too often. But um, the ones on uh, north north plain, there's a couple on that one that constantly flood and they just they just there's nowhere for the water to go, so right. it sits there till it drains. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> How are we looking for the winter coming up? Uh, we're getting there. Salt prices were down a little bit this year, so that's a good good sign. Uh, sand mm -hmm. prices actually went down too. I was surprised. Hmm. So we're looking we're looking pretty good. We're starting mm -hmm. to get things together and getting ready for the white stuff. Yeah. No. We, nobody knows what that'll be like yet. So who knows. George, you get your new truck yet? What's that? You get your new truck yet? Yeah, well, my next uh, question. They delivered it up to the dealership on Monday, and they're going through the truck to make sure everything's good. Um, I asked them to do a couple things to the truck. 
that I thought needed to be done and are going to put that on the list and do it. So, okay. Should be hopefully by the end of this week, beginning of next week, maybe. Okay. How are we looking for trees? Or any? Because I noticed there's been a lot of uh, tree work around town lately and people have had some questions about, you know, what's going on there and stuff. Most of the tree work that's been done lately has been from the power company. Power company. Yeah. Yep. Right away clearing. Both. Yeah, they're doing line clearing. Uh, plum tree. They're, yeah, plum tree was done. Um, some 47 yep. south was done. I think that's it for the lines that they were doing here and then they were moving to another town. Yeah, I noticed they were doing a lot down in Hadley on 47, too, if you keep going yep. down. Yeah. yeah, that's part of the same line that they're clearing. Yep. Uh, we're, we're still doing our, our tree work, you know, for our town, uh, pruning and trying to take some of the dead stuff out, some of the trees on South and North Main Street. Um, hangers from the storm the other day, we had some yep. we've been trying to take down. We still we still got some a little bit of cleaning up to do from that storm, but not nothing major. How's the health of the trees on, overall on North Main? Is it time to start replacing some? Or there is, there is probably going to be a couple next year, a couple, three, or probably three or four. I think they're going to be on the radar next year. Um, yep. I know some people are saying their trees need to be taken down right before some of the other trees, but yeah. some of their trees are pretty healthy compared to some of the other ones that are getting cut down. It's always proximity. If you don't watch the entire population, yours is the most important. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we, we keep an eye on them. And if people see something, I, you know, I encourage them to call us and let us know if there's something hanging over the sidewalk or any of that stuff. Right. Yeah, that's good to know who they can contact for that kind of stuff. George, George yeah. um, David, David had a nice question about the uh, trees. I was wondering on the, um, the Veterans Memorial, Especially be yeah. those, those elms with the their canopy, they they those things unfortunately don't seem to to be able Not to tidy enough. Yeah, is, I mean, is there anything we can do with those, or do we need to? I don't know. It's just I think they grow so fast, they're not strong enough to hold themselves together when we get heavy winds or or yeah. you know snow or whatever. So their branches are breaking on them. That's the last few, I know we had one die, yep. and then the last, the last one I think that was damaged was done by some wind or something or some heavy rain or a lot of wind yep. we had, and it broke a branch. The one on the corner up here, yeah. Yeah, so we ended up having to take that one down, but um, that's how it's been the last, I don't know, six, seven years with those things. They start getting so saggy, a lot of weight of leaves and stuff. I just don't think they have the strength. I don't know. I don't know what you could do with them. I don't know if we could contact the, the Elm Institute there. And I, I was wondering if we should talk to that Liberty Elm place. Yeah, because yep. that's and, where we got a bunch of them trees. I think they replaced one. Uh, we sent we sent a sample out to one of the, de the dead one there and yeah. to find out if it had Dutch Elm, which it didn't. For some reason, it just died. So can, can you uh, can you reach out to them and just say, hey, you know, this is what what do we need to do? Maybe yeah. maybe they have maybe maybe there's something that we need to we have to prune every other I don't know well, so, yeah, yeah. No, I know yeah time. I can we can try to make a phone call to them and find out if there's anything we can do to make them a little more hardier all right thanks George do they tend to send up more than one central leader because like is that like a problem early on with the pruning of them maybe or something you know then you start getting like weakened crotches and stuff yeah sometimes I think that all depends you know, your best tree is only going to have one main trunk. Yeah. I mean, if you get some leaders that split, that's generally a weak spot in any tree, really. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> maybe, and maybe they've got more info now, too, that more of them are getting planted, you know, so getting yeah. feedback on them. So. All right. Thank uh, you, George. Just a, a couple of other highway related updates that I um, wanted George to be here for as well is so North Main Street, the MassDOT project has been advertised. Um, it's going out to bid next month. Um, and as you're all aware, you know, certain aspects had to be cut out because the budget grew over, over the course of the project and um, well, 
the the estimate grew the budget yeah. did not grow yeah. right. um and so one of the things uh, i think um george is in the town is interested in doing is uh there was a certain limit to the paving that they cut back and i think we're going to try and do that out of chapter 90 right george right. Uh, for the paving and then there's also uh replacing a storm drain um around uh the corner of warner drive yeah. um street. and so i i guess i just wanted to bring it up because we're trying to uh I, i'm thinking about applying for a housing choice community grant um because we're a housing choice community um and wrapping that into the 120 north main okay. had some requests um and some of the project costs um, might be eligible for that grant as well. Um, so it's all sort of related to the same area. And, and so I thought we would try and package that up and um, apply for that. So it would be the storm drain replacement, uh, potentially the water connection fees. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was one other cost uh, related to it. But um, I guess I also wanted to ask, we, we did get another request for, um, uh, what are they called, uh, extra work authorization from the designers uh, for assistance through, um, I guess through construction, if, if there are any questions of the engineers, um, basically to have them on retainer for once, once the contract has been bid out. Um, so could I ask a question, uh, Jeff? Yeah. So why would the engineers need to be on retainer with the town if at this point our deliverables was to 75% to MassDOT for MassDOT to run the project? Uh, that's a good question. question. I gonna, right. I'll ask, right. the I'll, town I'll, the I'll, town has funded you know upwards of three hundred thousand dollars of engineering to hand to the state to fit inside the state framework the state's bidding the project the state's managing the project if they want to work mm -hmm. for the state go for it but you know <laughs> okay. why would why would we pay for that is my question right. and maybe maybe my head's stuck in the sand on this one because I'm sick of change orders but Mm -hmm. The reality is we delivered the goods the state asked for to the point where it could be bid. Those are bid documents and it's not a town project. Yeah. No, I think the question that's yeah. a, a valid point. We um, all had that. Number I mean, it, it's not that it. CHA doesn't want any more money. That's what their business is. You know, their paychecks with an occasional drawing it comes out of the other side. Yep. I will follow up on that then. And, uh, figure out whether or not the mass dot wants to uh, keep them on for that. Sure. Sure. And I don't want to take any money away from the project or, you know, impact the budget any more than it already has, but it seems to me a little, it seems to me worth asking the question. Yep. yep. So, so George, I do have another question for you yep. now, now, and I, I think the chief probably noticed it also, there seems to be a significant uptick of, uh, pedestrians on on Plum Tree Road, especially coming from the North 116 Flats, and I would think it's a it's a 116 or Plum Tree. I think I'd walk Plum Tree also. Mm -hmm. um, is there any any way we can look at what it would take to put sidewalk in? Yeah, I mean, we could we could look into it and, and try okay. to figure it out. We could probably maybe the next round. Of, I don't know if we could add it to the complete streets. Yeah. stuff. To that's how we, of, that's how we eventually go. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. sure, um, and that's a, that that would be the plan. Um, but I I mean, if if we're we're going to do the South Silver in the springtime, right? Mm -hmm. And that'll take us up to the um country kitchen kitchen garden no kitchen it's gonna garden. it's gonna go right to um as you're coming down through the first part there 
the last house before the field. Yeah. Where there's that water pipe. Yep. Yeah. It was supposed to go to right there, but yeah. we're going to stop it just before that house because the transition from the flat to go through that guy's yard uh, is going to yeah. require a bunch of extra work, like retaining walls and some other stuff. So yeah. we chose to, to stop it a little shorter. Yeah, because okay. a little change in grade right there. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. A, it's it's quite a quite a bit of a grade change, and yeah. uh, and then it then it gets real narrow, right where that water standpipe is. That's the, basically the edge of the road. So mm -hmm. right, so that's the edge of the town bound. It narrows okay. up. It begs the question, Tom, piggybacking on yeah. your your subject here. Would it make sense that maybe ask? We've worked now with Sarah Campbell for a couple of projects. Maybe we could ask her for a design budget to be able to bring that to town meeting. Oh, Scott, that's a wonderful idea. All right. So this we, we have to submit that stuff for complete streets. Let's ask her for a design and maybe pick a, a length or a side or what makes on, sense on, on plum tree. Uh, right. Yeah, on, on plum tree. Yep. And maybe that that'll be something you could look at, George, at least to get the get that ball rolling. Right. Because we probably won't be able to do it on one side, I would think. No, it, it, no, I, I think one side would be would and, and because of the problem would be to me is be going over the brook. Right. But right. I think if you kept it one, if you kept it one width, you could go you you could go over, you could go over yeah. um you could go over the that bridge. Yeah. And 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 then then and, and again that it's been something that many residents have talked to the board of selectmen in the past about. I I mean that goes back maybe before before David I think right Scott I I mean yep. we we we've had we've had a number I I mean George we've talked about it before also haven't we right yeah. Yeah, and even before the apartment complex, I think that just more and more people are out walking along there. Right. Uh, and, and dogs and, and everything. And yeah. yeah. Makes sense. And especially with it being from a road traffic standpoint, it's a very popular cut up and down. And I'm sure you know Chief and I'm people bombing up and down that road. So the sidewalk will definitely add to the safety of it. That's for sure. So <clears throat> um well, we still have George. Do you want, we do want to talk about the municipal mowing too, Jeff? Yeah, but before we get to that, uh, just a quick note on complete streets, um, which is that uh, we mentioned South Silver and, and South Main, and uh, I'm working on getting a letter out to the residents along those routes, um, explaining a little bit more about the project when we expect it to happen. And George and I are going to go out. I think we're shooting for... Uh, Saturday, November 14th in the morning, uh, just to do a, a walkabout if anybody wants to come look at what's going on, um, doing that on, on Silver. And then um, obviously anybody who has questions can contact me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them or get the answers for you. Um, but we are starting to do outreach and hopefully going out to bid this uh, winter on that, those complete streets projects. Yeah, remind us because I wouldn't mind getting out there for that. Be yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so the the municipal mowing, I think we had talked about this a few months ago, um, and I believe there was a, a request to to dust it off and take a look at it and update it. And um, George and Cindy and I talked about it, and we thought about what other things, uh, how how we could improve the contract and um, one of the things that the select board had recommended was the the term be January to January 1st to December 31st and you know I checked with Andrea um, Woods at FERCOG who said yeah that's that's not a problem you just put one line in that says you know contingent on continued funding and um, that's not really an issue um, so that, that was one of the changes we made. I think that, uh, you know, the, we added, uh, I think we clarified some of the things about 
making sure that that any of the hard surfaces in the parks were cleared. Um, we clear. Uh, I think we added. George, did we add a, a spring and fall cleanup or just a fall cleanup? I know we school? talked. We talked about adding one or the other. Um, I don't yeah. know if I don't know if we were going to do that or not. Uh, at least for the, at least for the the school, the old library, and uh, I think the town hall is usually done by um, the local guy through the library. So I don't know oh, if yeah. that has to be in there. Yeah. Um, one or the other would be would be ideal because it it gets pretty caked with leaves and stuff and it, it sticks and stuff like that in the spring or even, you know, the fall time. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't have a chance to rot. And then you get a lot of leaf litter sitting around there come the spring. Yeah. Okay. So can I put my trustees hat on from the Riverside cemetery? I put that paragraph out in front of me and I mm -hmm. like the required mandatory meeting that makes a great deal of sense. You know, one thing we don't see in any of these spaces is definition of the actual areas, right? And we have seen at the cemetery um, a pattern of ignoring the southernmost section beyond any of the existing uh, monuments. And that is part of the cemetery that needs to be mowed. So at some point, maybe the maybe your intent, Jeff, was the walkthrough covered it. But I think somehow, in some way, the definition of areas for maybe each of the spaces or walkthrough language for each of the spaces prior to bid makes some sense. I can say I, I've spent a fair amount of Saturdays and or Sundays just getting those edges back that are being ignored. And as a trustee, that's that's uh, you know something that if the town's going to pay for it, they should get the whole job, or we should do something else. Good point, Scott. Yeah, and, and you could pick it. You know, we've heard from the athletics over here. Maybe not so much this year. We've heard from the school. You know, and it seems to kind of like be a little bit of a how do I describe it? Maybe just a, a better definition. That's all. You know, saying 14 mowings is easy when you look at a calendar. You go, okay, yeah. I'm going to go there 14 times. You, you put it on your calendar and you go. Or you create a master schedule for all the properties and you go. Uh, but does it make sense to put in like a map for each property yeah, with yeah, the bounds of it? Well, we certainly got a map. Yeah. It's easy. We can do a map. Yeah. And we, we had talked about a master schedule. And I think that the concern was that, you know, if you get three or four or longer dry weeks in a row like we did yeah. this yeah. summer you don't necessarily want them coming out yep. but you yep. so uh, you want to have some flexibility but certainly. no i completely agree i don't i'm, I'm not suggesting a, a master schedule be created i was looking at it from a contractor's point of view with multiple properties i've got to be in sunderland these x amount of times you you create one as as the owner of the contract not the owner of the property yep. But a walkthrough may make sense for each of them. Yeah, I think it does. So you, you've seen some of the, I don't want to call them shortcomings. It's like gaps, right? There's like gaps that are created. You assume that Scott knows where to mow. Well, Scott looks and says, I'm going to mow here until somebody says something. Our yep. <laughs> grass hasn't been mowed in like four or five weeks. Yeah, yeah. right. No, and you're absolutely right in this, in this case. In, in the, this particular season, absolutely right. Yeah, he's been all over the map this year. Yeah. Anyway, so, I, I like that language about the walkthrough and the highlight to it because it, in any of the properties the town uh, has contracted this out at, have had feedback and interactions with with multiple contractors over everybody who's bid it. Yep. Yep. Certainly add that language. And I think one of, one of the important things um, was was to try and get it out before there's snow on the ground, so that yep. people can do the walkthroughs and, and actually see the areas. Yep. That um, makes good sense. So, are there are there other suggestions? Because we'd probably want to get it out pretty soon if we're shooting for next mowing season and and trying to get the contract signed for January one, twenty twenty one. Are you? 
comfortable with me just adding that language and, and starting to get it out? I am. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Want to do a motion? Yeah, move move to insert the language successful bidder required to attend mandatory meeting. And maybe Jeff, the language doesn't have to be in each space. Maybe it can be one of the requirements of the bid or as part of the bid document. And it carries through for each of the spaces versus cutting and pasting. But anyway, hmm. move to uh, approve this, including the language uh, for required walkthrough. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so maybe they'll get us back on a better foot for next mowing season, you know? <clears throat> All right. Uh, anything else for George? That's it. All right. Hey, thanks for coming, George. Appreciate hey, thank it. Thank you so much, George. You guys have a good night. Hey, you too. Thanks. Thank you, George. All right. Um, and then, Chief, if you could just hang around until we get to our uh, COVID update and we can talk about how we're, we're canceling, not canceling Halloween, too. <laughs> so when we get to that one. Do you want to um, jump to that? We could uh, do that, yeah. And then right, this way, the Chief doesn't hang around for two more, doesn't need to hang around for two more budget top rooms, two more bullet points. Yeah, I was torn between letting them go or hitting that and using it as an incentive to move through those fast. <laughs> you know, it's always that management of it. You know, Good move move to a point. Mark Zinen, there's there's one. Okay, there you go. All right. Hey, hey, Dave, you, you've yeah. already lost your 15 I, minute meeting. I know we have. <laughs> we, we lost that on the first Dave, topic. So, Dave, come on. <laughs> I'm trying to salvage what little we can, you know. Remember when you hired Jeff, you told Jeff that you were going to do half hour meetings. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't he say that, Jeff? We probably had like two Three of those, five. maybe. <laughs> uh, Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor of appointing Mark Zinen to the Community Pathways Committee. Aye. Aye. With, uh, with thanks. Thanks, Mark, yep. for volunteering. Appreciate it. And that, that's a good committee. There's a lot of stuff going on down in the center of town right now. So, um, but yeah, let's let's jump to the COVID one because I do not want to have you have to sit here and listen while I read these two APR notices. So, <laughs> why don't we jump down to our COVID update and then we can talk about Halloween and anything else that's related to that. I know I know we're going to have Laurie on, so that's a, probably a very good sign. Uh, yeah, she's she was unable to to make it this evening, but she did send me an email uh, notifying me that we have we did have one new case in town, um, and uh, the the good news is that at the last count, but from the state, we were moved from a red high risk category to gray less than five total cases in the past fourteen weeks. So I uh, wanted to make sure to mention that. Um, I have a, a couple other small things, but we can certainly talk about Halloween mm -hmm. next. Um, uh, you yeah. know, uh, I no, think sorry. the chief put something out on Facebook about, about no town sponsored events. And um, we cribbed that for the website as well. Um, to, to help people understand what's going on. Yep. Because, it, <clears throat> right, because we're, we're not doing any town sanctioned events. And I think people have to use their own judgment about private gatherings and things like that. And keep in mind the regulations and everything. And hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll do that. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have uh, police officers out. We still yeah. have officers out just to make sure. No, because it is Halloween after all. No. Um, and just to, do you remember the color zones? Because the, I know we went from red to gray, but it's an odd um, color grouping that they chose. Uh, they clearly didn't have input from Pantone or any of those groups on that. But like, we go from like red to gray, and then what's the, um, what's the next one down? Do you remember? Blue. Gray is, is, the, is sort of the lowest. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, above eight positive cases per 100,000 population is red. Um, yellow is between five and eight per 100,000. And okay. gray is less than uh, five total. Okay. 
All right. Just so people get an idea when they hear a color, like what it corresponds to, you know. And Chief, correct me if I got that totally wrong. No, oh, you're right. So gray is less than five total. Green is uh, four cases for uh, per 100. Then yellow is uh, five to eight. And then red. Okay. All right. Forgot green. Thank you. My blue came from another state. Yeah. <laughs> well, every, every one you look at on every map right. has a different color range. Right. So. Blue is the way people feel because of all this. Yeah, exactly. exactly right. Right. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Any, anything else about Halloween? Well, and just on just back on the color, I, I mean, yeah. some, some some people may not understand the importance of it. And and I, I agree with what and Tony's no longer on. It's unfortunate. I do agree with what Tony. Part of what Tony talks about is the positivity rate involved in testing that that's a very, very important thing. But Unfortunately, Sunderland is a small community with a high, with with and and I I think if you talk to medical doctors and and educators and all kinds of people, if we can have our kids in school learning, especially our youngest kids in school learning, that is the optimum place to be, and not not trying to learn at home. When we when we get red, we're, we're indicated by red. All of a sudden, that calls that um, ability into question. So, I, I mean, when you're, it may not a twenty year old may not understand that. Um, but if if you know of a twenty year old can remember or if he looks and see has brothers or sisters or I, I mean, they, 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 it's not hard to understand that you want our young kids into in that going to schools, you, you want them in schools in person and the Sunderland administration and staff have done a, and faculty have done a wonderful job keeping um, our students up and um, working well, but it's all thrown in, it's all thrown into it's all thrown into disarray when we put a red color next to it and next to Sunderland, okay. and that that's why it concerns us. And and me is there, and and that's why it concerns us at North One Sixteen Flats and 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 Sugar Bush well. North 116 Flats and Cliffside and Northwoods and, and all the other places. The, the, and, and houses, the house parties also. And that and I think that's why the chief the chief knows and that's why he takes it so serious also. You know? So very true. I was glad to hear when we dropped out of the red zone. That was good news. It it, it is. It, it it is. Um and 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 again. The good part of UMass is the good part about UMass. They're pop. they the way they're doing it is they have they're they're requiring the two right, Jeff. I think it's two tests two tests a week now of the people or the people that are coming back. And when you find it early, and some people on the national level can't figure this out, when you do when you when you find out early, then you can do co effective okay. contact tracing. Exactly. And, you can, and you can kind of stop it in, in the butt really quick. Yep. So, and I think that's what, that's what happened by okay. having, the, having the testing, having testing available and, and testing should be available to all our residents right now. Right. At it's this important. time, I mean, what, we're seven months into COVID, I think around seven months, we yeah. should have, te testing should be an on-demand thing, right? Right now, if you want to get tested, you should be able to get tested. You don't. You shouldn't have to get tested if you have a doctor's note or if you have symptoms. You should just be able to get a test. Right. And, uh, on that note, one of one of the things I wanted to mention is there was a code red alert that went out um, about testing and availability at Bay State and Greenfield, um, and it's it's also on our website on the COVID nineteen page. Um, but if residents call the the Hours to call are between 5 and 8 p.m. Um, and then there's testing available 
on Wednesday and Thursday, I, I believe, uh, for, for residents <laughs> up in Greenfield. So, okay. Jeff, Jeff, you know, I, I I had one of one of our residents in town. Basically, um, sh she was ecstatic that she could finally get a COVID test because she couldn't get a test, couldn't get a test, and she could finally get a test. That that's should, good. That that should not be a that should not be a problem. We, yeah. we should, some 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 someplace somebody's missing the whole the whole the whole process. We should if somebody wants to feel comfortable, they want to get a test, they should be able to get a test. But just so you know, there's people taking advantage of it. Thank you for that for helping set that up. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. Any um, any other COVID related topics for the week? Uh, just uh, two small things. Um, one, uh, maybe three small things. One, um, the <laughs> CRF. Don't look too close, uh, Jeff. The application, um, the request from the schools was a, a, a little, they gave us clarity um, and it, it came in below what we had sort of budgeted. So I just shifted things around a little bit. I um, threw the, the difference into uh, social distancing measures for public buildings, figuring that's somewhere I could see us spending more money if necessary as we begin to um, reopen. Hey, hey, Jeff. Could you talk to um, um, Christina, the director at the senior center? They're, 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 they, she may be able to use some, some extra funding on that COVID. Yeah, good point, Tom. As you're going into the season where it's moving indoors and right availability right. Yep. and spacing. Yeah, good point. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the note of schools, um, the state is asking that regional school districts be sub sub recipients. Um, so one of the things that we got today and, and was in your packet is uh, basically a, an agreement that they're going to only spend funds on eligible expenses, um, CARES Act eligible expenses, um, and then seek reimbursement so that's for frontier um the elementary school can just you know send us invoices and we can pay it directly but for regional for the regional school um they wanted to set it up that way for accountability purposes mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, and darius has already signed that um and then the last thing is is just to let people know that the state has a small business grant that's available. Information's up on our website. It's the Community Compact Small Business Grant. Applications are due uh, November 12th. So there's a little bit of time left and um, we're trying to do outreach to, to businesses in town to let them know about this. It's my understanding is it's not a loan. It's actually grant funds, um, so they don't have to pay it back. It's for businesses affected by COVID. So uh, just another resource to hopefully to know. be helpful. Great. And then if we're letting if we're letting the the chief go, maybe there was one more thing we wanted to talk we, about. We tried, chief. We tried. Yeah. Good news. Good news. One yeah. more thing. As you know, we have the drug box out in the lobby, uh, but with COVID, it's been kind of difficult to try to match everybody up with being an officer here or doing with the clerk being here. Uh, so we took part in the, uh, the the National Drug Take Back Day this past Saturday. Nice. We posted an officer here during it, uh, and we turned in uh, 55 pounds of drugs Saturday. Wow. wow. Just for us. That's good. 55 pounds, it doesn't get flushed down our uh, sewers and rivers and everything. So that's good or some other place. Excellent. I think that the DA said it was 3,000 pounds in his district total. Wow. Oh, wow. That was good. on yesterday's or today's news. Was it? Hmm. That's good. It gets back in the right place. So excellent. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks for coming, Chief. We appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. Anytime. All right. Have a good night. You too.
Thanks. All right. Um, actually, before we do the APR notices, we've got a draft budget memo to talk yes. about that time yes. of year. So... I see the dates are a little later than normal, Jeff. Is that? Uh, the dates were based on, I believe, what was in the letter last year. Mm -hmm. So we could certainly adjust that. I think um, one of the challenges for us is going to be knowing when when free cash, what our free cash looks like when it's available. Um, I, I'm fine with the dates as long as we have enough time to have dialogue with department heads that doesn't process doesn't seem to be rushed as we get closer toward needing to post the warrant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the dates in the, in the mem draft memo were 2018 and 2019. So mm -hmm. obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll update that, but um, you know, if you think it's, it's better to do it earlier in December, we can, I can certainly, I, you know, I, again, my, my fear is that we get toward early spring, late winter, and it's, there's a sense of urgency. Um, if you receive, if you receive your budget documentation from say the regional school district, January, and they need to be able to take their vote to have it to the four towns earliest, one of the four towns that has the earliest town meeting, they may be well voting on their draft budgets in February and that doesn't necessarily allow us time to have an honest discussion around it. And sometimes that crunch feels 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 like there wasn't a full there wasn't time for a full exploration of reasons. Yep. So again, just food for thought. Yeah. Earlier okay. the better in that case. The other thing to think about, Scott, is that the uh, the governor just submitted FY twenty one. Yeah, we don't have a state yeah. budget yet. No, I totally get it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's. So yeah, let's well, just let's just run with it and keep you know it was just a point of discussion. Yeah, uh, well that kind of kind of leads into the the other like placeholder there about the the wage and cola stuff because we're still kind of waiting. I, this is clearly the oddest year ever mm -hmm. with that respect. So, so circling back to the budget memo, I I move to move to send it out. Okay. Sign Second. and send. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, the sooner we get that roll on the bet, just even in a regular year too. I think you're right because the more the more time we have to discuss it, and especially if it's a tougher budget and everything, the more time we have to grapple with and discuss, the better. Yep, I Good would point. agree. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. So just to clarify, the, those approximate dates in 2020 or, and 21 are okay. Yeah. You know, January. Okay. okay. We'll just be. A, we'll just we'll just have to work extra hard, Jeff. <laughs> And I can add another sentence. Hey, as early as you want to get it in, we'd appreciate. It. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You sure. Know, these that, are that would be good. Deadlines, not you know. No so for the for the general public, the content of the letter asks for a level services budget. That's important to bear in mind. There's a fundamental difference between level services and level funding. Level funding over time, of course, is a declination of services. Yep. So we're asking for a level services budget as well as a capital budget. Yeah, thank you. That's actually a very important clarification, Scott. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. Got to hopped up all around there a little bit, but other than we just have our um, APR notices and then we've got any select board and town administrator updates, so I can, I'll do the, as a part of procedure, we have to read these two notices for two APR properties. Um, <clears throat> that now, have we got everything else taken care of for these, Jeff? Otherwise? Uh, yes, and then if you're, the board is so inclined, there's the opportunity to reduce the notice period from 120 days to 60 days. And we've been asked to do that. So we would need a uh, vote. Motion on that, okay. Um, procedurally, do we need to do that before or after the reading of the notices? Does it, does it matter after, okay, that's what that, okay. All right, so with that note, I will, let me just make sure I've got, 
I can okay. pull them up on screen too. If that would be yeah, fun. why don't we do that? <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm just looking for what's actually different on each one because. Probably the address, right, Davey? Right, the yeah. address is certainly be one element, yep. Yeah. I think that's about it. Oh, uh, hey now. Montague Road, yeah. And so Montague, it really just mentions the road. Yeah. And this, okay, so which one do you, okay. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I have the, the right one up. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so bear with me as I read through this. <clears throat> Notice a proposed acquisition of, on of an agricultural preservation, AKA APR, restriction on the property in the town of Sunderland. The date of this notice is October 19th, 2020. Notice of the proposed acquisition is hereby given to, and in this case, since we're a town, chairman of the board of selectmen of the town of Sunderland. Separate notice will be given to the department to the appropriate county commissioners, regional planning agency, and the members of the general court representing the district in which the land is located. In compliance with General Laws Chapter 7C, Section 37, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, acting by and through its Department of Agricultural Resources, the department, hereby gives notice that it proposes to acquire an agricultural property restriction, aka APR, on the real property identified herein for the purpose of protecting the perpetuity, <laughs> its superior and productive agricultural resources by preventing their conversion to other uses. The application received by MDAR indicates that the property is owned by Stephen F. Gunn and consists of parcel or parcels located at Montague Road and Sunderland as approximately represented on the attached map and that's with all the paperwork. The APR may encompass all or parts of the area shown. Oh, look at that, perfect. Oh, it's right off of 47 heading north for folks. And the property, the current use of the property is primarily for corn silage. <clears throat> Following the recording of the APR, the use of the subject property is limited to agricultural use as more particularly set forth in the APR document, General Laws, Chapter 184, Section 31, and the regulations of the department, 330 CMR 22 and, and sequences. And that's from Michelle Padula, the APR regional planner. All right. And then we have a second one. All right. <clears throat> and the notice of proposed acquisition of an agricultural preservation restriction. Whoop, hold on. Sorry about that. It's my light. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind because I actually, it gets me up instead yeah, right, of sitting right. <laughs> So it's not just interpretive dance. Exactly. You know, or your Apple watch telling you, oh, time to get up, right? Time to get up. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> and the date of this notice is October 19th, 2020. Notice of the proposed acquisition is hereby given to, in this case, the chairman of the board of selectmen of Sunderland. <clears throat> or say, I should say chairperson of the board of selectmen. They haven't quite updated it like we have in this case, mm -hmm. but... We're not selectmen either. Yeah, right. I know, right? Exactly, the select board. <clears throat> uh, separate notice will be given by the department to the appropriate county commissioners, regional planning agency, and members of the general court representing the district in which the land is located. In compliance with General Laws Chapter 7C, Section 37, the Massachusetts, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, acting by and through its Department of Agricultural Resources, the department, hereby gives notice that it is proposed to acquire an agricultural preservation restriction, APR, on the real property identified herein for the purpose of protecting in perpetuity its superior and productive agricultural resources by preventing their excuse me, conversion to other uses. The application received by MDAR indicates the property is owned by Stephen F. Gunn and consists of parcel or parcels located at Whitmore Crossroad in Sunderland as approximately represented on the attached map. And Jeff's got that right there. So that's sort of like a cross from the other parcel, right? Yeah. If you're looking at, you know, if you happen to have, have, happen to have them, two of them side by side, so folks are wondering, because you'd be coming up 47 and the other one is like kind of across to the right. <clears throat> 
Let's see. Uh, let's see. And it's located at Whitmore Crossroad in Sunderland as approximately represented on the attached map as we just showed there. The APR may encompass all or parts of the area shown. The current use of the property is primarily for corn silage. And the following the recording of the APR, the use of the subject property is limited to agricultural use as more particularly set forth in the APR document, the, the General Laws, Chapter 184, Section 31, and the regulations of the Department 330 CMR 22, and so forth. And that's also by Michelle Padula, the APR Regional Planner. Whew. All right. <clears throat> So do we have a motion on those two APR properties for our- um, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to, uh, instead of uh, cut, I'd like to cut the time from 120 days to 60 days. Okay. As part of the motion as well. All right, thank you. I'll second. All right, all those in favor for reducing the time down and the APRs? Aye. Aye. All right, thanks. And thanks for, for everybody who worked, who worked on these two parcels. Yes, because it's, you know, you just get this little notice at the end, but there's a lot of work that goes into that. Correct. The beginning. <clears throat> and that is a nice area along the river there too, or near it. So those are some prime agricultural usage. <clears throat> All right, so we just have a left on our agenda. We have our select board updates, if we have any, and then town administrator updates. I'm okay, Mr. Chair. All set. Scott, I uh, participated in a village center meeting last Thursday. Jeff was there as well. And it was follow up to the uh, input that Mass uh, DOT gave on Monday. And uh, the meeting was very constructive. It was very uh, thoughtful. And I think the goal there is to keep that group active uh, and with a sense of design for the entirety of the town center and the projects that are all happening. So that that's said, excellent. it was very good. Because that, that's, that's actually very important because that work really will kind of be a legacy for many years to come. Yeah. With all that stuff that's going on there, that's great. <clears throat> um, and we'll turn it over to you, Jeff. There's probably nothing going on at this point, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, two things, definitely quick. Um, one is the elementary school, uh, I think is going to be do, putting in a, a, looking at putting in a sensory path um, along the walkway around the school. And it's just going to be um, sort of zigzags and different stations painted hmm. on the road. So no, no impediments or anything like that, but just something hmm. for uh, the students to do outside to get some activity. Um, nice. and, and they were approached by some teachers who wanted to do that. Um, and then the last thing, which is just sort of fun and hopefully a nice way to end the meeting, <laughs> is this beautiful picture was featured in the Atlantic. Nice. Um, the current issue or? Uh, I don't know if it was an issue. It was the online version. I guess they're doing, okay. it was a series of pictures from Massachusetts. Um, and unfortunately, the or, or fortunately, the caption said it was taken from Sugarloaf Mountain, Sunderland, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, okay. Not but, technically accurate, but that's, but still. I, yep. It is a picture of Sunderland. Exactly. Bless so, you. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a gorgeous picture. So. Well, actually, yeah. it's, a, it's a picture of Hadley and Whiteley yeah. in Sunderland. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, 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 the, and the town that the mountain's in is not even in the picture, but. Yeah, exactly, right? right? That, that, that's the, the funny irony. And, and actually, you see Hadley, you see Mount Warner down there, and you see uh, Amherst to the left and the Holyoke Range. And... Yep. and there's a reason why that picture gets taken so often, I mean, because it's sort of a unique geological thing where you have that edge of Sugarloaf and then nothing until you hit the Holyoke Range. And then the twist of the river, it's beautiful. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great shot. We're lucky to be able to see that whenever we want. Nice. All right. Um, and then we have uh, our next important meeting dates to remember. So our next meeting will be next week and that'll be November 2nd. And just as a reminder, in case anybody forgot, I hate to be the harbinger of this, but it is that time of year. 
and this weekend our clocks will fall back and would somebody for the love of god propose legislation to stop this insanity <laughs> and stop moving the clocks but anyway that's beside the point and then election day yes that is coming up in case nobody noticed that that'll be tuesday november 3rd 2020 <coughs> um, what, what are the hours there's an election for... going on dave <laughs> I, I heard something about it but um do we have any any reminders from our town clerk or anything about the drop box or and the hours like you were saying scott yeah i just wanted to remind the, the public jeff do we know we have a drop box behind the building yep. and early voting hours are where and when Early voting is at 12 School Street. The entrance is in the back of the building. Um, let's see, today is the 26th. So yep. tomorrow is 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Wednesday is 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thursday is 8 a.m. to noon. And Friday is 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Thank Great. You. Thanks for the reminder. And thanks for everybody who's helping uh, during these extended uh, election hours. Yep. It's very much appreciated. And if you have any questions, check out the website and feel free to call the uh, town clerk to that. Everybody would be glad to help you out. And they've been doing a great job. So, all right. Um, with that, do you want to keep going, Tom? Or should do we, or... Uh, you almost got two hours, Dave. You I might, know. Well, we may as well round it out, right? <laughs> you, 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 10 more minutes, you got two hours. I mean... <laughs> I can so give you guys a F preview Cat, of the F next Cat, meeting. It's, it's funny, FCAT snoring, so I think you got <laughs> FCAT sleeping. Uh, I thought that was feedback in my uh, headphones. No, yeah. he's snoring. <laughs> you just, just heard one thump, and it was his head hitting the desk. Hitting the yeah, desk. I yep. think you're right, Scott. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor of adjournment at, uh, what is it? It is 2019. Thank right. you, John. Appreciate that feedback. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.